Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode for the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn. And today we are going to the great western desert state of Utah. And we're going to talk with two professors at Bingham Young University, Jay Buckley. Jay received his PhD from the University of Nebraska and has worked at Bingham Young since 2001. He is also the director of the Charles Ritt Center for Western Studies and a very distinguished Western historian. Joining him and me is Jeffrey Noakes. He is an associate dean at Bingham Young and also a professor of history. He is with Bingham Young since 2006 and received his PhD from the University of Utah. What are we talking about? We are talking about their new book, Great Plains Forts, published by Bison Press in December 2003, 2023, not 2003. That would have been a long time ago. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. And let's just get into it here. Tell us the origin story. How did you two agree to write a book about Western forts? Well, I had done my um, PhD work at the University of Nebraska in, and uh, at the Center for Great Plains Studies. And they have an agreement with the University of Nebraska Press through Bison Books to do a series on the Great Plains. So I was approached by the, the director of that series uh, to see if I would be interested in, in writing a volume for them. And so we bounced around some ideas on possible topics and agreed that it would be interesting to write about the Great Plains forts. Um, then I had a few other book projects come before and I needed to get back on this project. So I invited my good friend and colleague, Jeff Noakes to join me. He and I had done several other book projects together and I really enjoyed those experiences. So I asked him if he wanted to collaborate on this project with me and he said, yes. So we uh, co-authored this book and Ooh. I think it's a lot of fun. It covers a lot of topics from indigenous fortifications and 1100 AD, all the way up to Air Force bases uh, today. So it's it's kind of a sweeping uh, broad survey, but I think there's some interesting stories and, and details that the general public will enjoy. So Jeff, I'm going to throw it to, over to you. Is there any kind of like, like I, I had one time with guys who were like, we decided to write this book during a baseball game. Any kind of situation <laughs> yeah. where you kind of go back and you're like, ooh, that was the moment where we two agreed over like, like, like something, like a dinner or so to write this. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't remember to tell you the truth in any kind of moment, but. I know Jay and I have worked together, as he said, on a few projects. And so uh, when he approached me with this, he, he, so I should probably clarify, I'm in the history department, but my PhD is in teaching and learning mm -hmm. with a focus on history teaching. Yes. So, so I'm not a historian in the traditional sense of historian. And so uh, knowing that I could lean on him for his history background and but I'm a, a decent storyteller, and so, uh, and a and a decent writer, and so, leaning on his strengths and me doing what I could to to help him, uh, it it turned out to be a fun project to work on together. As a follow up, how did how did it work? Like you know, this is, I usually, uh, kind of 
repeating myself here a little bit. I usually did not do an interview like edited collection or two author books because in the past when I did written interviews, it was very difficult to get two people. They had to coordinate their answers, but here it's a great opportunity. How did you guys, how did you manage that? Like reading your book, I could not detect like there was one chapter that definitely was written by a different person that it, it was one voice throughout. How did you manage to get that done so well? Well, well, when when the first when we started, the first process was deciding what the chapters were going to be mm -hmm. dealing with. And Jay, again, with his background, he had some good ideas, and I made a few suggestions, and we worked out a table of contents, mm -hmm. and then we split that table of contents just about fifty fifty him taking the areas where he had some great expertise and he would he would do the first draft of those chapters okay. and then in the other chapters where i felt like i might be able to you know brush up on some of my history and look at some primary sources and things i took on those chapters and and so we wrote drafts of the chapters independently with i mean our offices are just down the hall from each other and so there'd be those kinds of collaborations where mm -hmm. I'd get stumped on a question or he or he wondered something. And so there's a little bit of collaboration during the writing process. But typically, we would pretty much write independently the chapters uh, to start. And then we would share and go through and, like you said, try to create that common voice. So he he's more academic in his writing than I am. He, he is he is a really a talented historian and. And the press didn't want footnotes. They wanted something that was a little more accessible to the mm -hmm. general public. And so I, I would tone him down sometimes and say, <laughs> "Jay, I'm a little academic here. He's just too smart, you know." <laughs> and then every once in a while, he'd tell me, "You got to beef this up a little bit." And and we'd revise. And anyway, that was my take on on how we put it together. Jay, I don't know if you have things to add. And then at the end. Um... I kind of went through the whole manuscript and and worked on some transitions and mm -hmm. added a few segments um, to augment chapters that were a little shorter than they than they were and things like that. And so we did work hard to have a, a unified voice. And Jeff's such a gifted storyteller that I could provide him some uh, research materials and he could create a, a narrative out of it. And so that was that was pretty cool. Um, so. It was a, a wonderful collaboration. Yeah, there were, I, I, I kind of thinking back, there were some nice stories in there of kind of like the, um, what was it? I think the, was it the fourth chapter? Yeah, the fourth chapter where you talk about that lady that travels to different outposts with her husband. Um, that was sort of very yeah, engagingly done. Yeah. Jeff tells that story well. Do you want to just give a little narrative of, of Susan Shelby McGoffin? Yes. So Susan was a young woman when she married an older man. Was he, he was how old, much older than her? 20? Twice as old. <laughs> yeah. She was just a teenager. Mm. And he, he had made his fortune on the Santa Fe Trail. And so not long after they got married, he outfitted a caravan and they were ready to go and she traveled with them and she kept this absolutely delightful journey journal of the nice. trip. I mean it is just a joy to read every page of that she was uh she was a teenager mm -hmm. and she was romantic as could be she called herself the wandering princess of the prairie and she, there were servants that were accompanying her and just uh it, it's just really fun to read her uh her journal um somewhere along the trail the, she had some trouble with the carriage and she was ejected from the carriage and fell and she was expecting a baby at that time and after that incident she started to worry about the baby and it wasn't long after there that they after that time they got to bent's fort and while she was at Bent's Fort, she gave birth to a stillborn baby that just was absolutely traumatic for her. Oh. And at the that same day that she gave birth, 
an indigenous indigenous woman came to the fort and gave birth also to a healthy baby, which just added to her distress. Yes. But it, it really is a great story to tell about the nature of the forts, because you have mm -hmm. people coming, indigenous people and travelers passing through that were all uh, pretty much welcome to this fort and knew it was a resource that could help them with repairing their uh, wagons or carriages or or giving birth to a baby, whatever, you know, the needs were at the time. But Susan, if, if, if your viewers have a chance, want to read something that's just really special, her, her journal, uh, if you did some Googling, you could find what it's you listed in our bibliography. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We I tried mean... to include as many primary sources as we could from a whole variety of perspectives. So mm -hmm. we have indigenous voices, African-American voices, women voices, mm -hmm. immigrant voices, military voices. And right. hopefully it kind of presents a fuller, richer account than just, you know, what was happening at some military fort on the plains or something like that. Right, right. No, certainly. And I think that's... Um, I, I, you know, I'm trying to think back when I, when I saw your book and asked the press to send me a copy, I guess at the moment I sort of was expecting like maybe the fur trade, but then mostly the military. And you really surprised me with the first chapter because that I had not expected. I had not like, hadn't studied much about, so Tell us a little bit about Native Americans and actually having fortified villages. Sure. Well, that's one of the things we tried to do is have some surprises in each of the chapters so that right. the readers who even thought they might know about a topic would, would find something new. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested to, to think about the way Indigenous people um, use fortifications in their villages and on war raids and in defense, um, because like you, we were often raised thinking of Hollywood and the movies that we see, and you know John Wayne films and <laughs> John Ford directed things, and most right. of them are in kind of the Civil War Indian Wars era, and they're mostly military forts, mm -hmm. and so our minds automatically are drawn to that as like the first thing we think about with forts. But we often don't think about how forts preceded um, any uh, newcomers coming to the American continent. Um, indigenous people have been constructing fortifications uh, as long as they've lived here. And so um, one of the things that I had to do as a historian was to use archaeology and uh, other kinds of sources that I don't typically use in my writing to try to draw out what life was like in 1000 AD or 1500 AD mm -hmm. pre-contact. And so one of the things that emerged, however, was um, as uh, indigenous people began moving out onto the Great Plains, they first started on the fringes because those were the most livable areas, places that had water, trees, other kinds of resources. Um, and before the acquisition of the horse, it was very difficult to live out on the plains uh, and in a permanent type of way. And so what happened was these uh, earth lodge villages and other kinds of structures were created um, up and down the river systems of the eastern part of the Great Plains. And indigenous people began fortifying those villages in the 13 and 1400s because of increased indigenous pressures and raids from other indigenous parties. And so uh, groups like the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples were creating fortified villages in the Dakotas and um, other locales, as well as tribes in the South, uh, the Caddoan speaking peoples in Texas and uh, Oklahoma and other places. And so it was kind of interesting for me to um, not only combine those archaeological records, but 
use uh, oral histories from native sources mm -hmm. and European accounts of when they visited those villages and they would describe how many uh, homes were there and how how large the palisades were and how deep the ditches were and yeah. about the gates and all of that different kind of thing. And we don't often think of fortified villages on the plains yeah. as being a, a place where you'd live, but you can understand if there were threats, yeah. uh, you would want to protect yourself. And so mm -hmm. then we had to find out what are they protecting themselves from? And so some of these sites have huge massacres of, you know, four or 500 people, men, women, and children that were killed and ritualistically mutilated and buried in mass graves, you know, uh, as early as like 1400 AD. And so this is, you know, hundreds of years before any kind of contact with uh, Europeans or other newcomers. And so it just adds richness to the story of an indigenous point of view. And it continues up through... Um, the 19th and 20th centuries as well. Mm -hmm. So um, when Blackfeet raiding parties would uh, go to steal horses, for instance, they would construct certain kinds of defensive lodges that were quick to put up, but a form of refuge in case uh, people they stole their horses from weren't happy that they had. <laughs> so um, <laughs> right. it was kind of fun to to just look at all of the different kinds of things, both temporary and permanent uh, mm -hmm. kinds of fortifications of of earth, stone, wood, other kinds of materials, and so that was a, that was a really fun chapter to write. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna because just as you were talking, came to me sort of as a thought, like, what were your boundaries? Did you how did you define your boundaries for the Great Plains? Because that's that's the frame of it. Like I'm, um, like yeah, like one text. of the one Go of ahead. the blessings I had was as a graduate student at the University of Nebraska. I was a research assistant at the Center for Great Plains Studies. Ah, and as a cheated. result, <laughs> the cartographers and geographers had already delineated. Mm -hmm. what their points of view of what the Great Plains was due to vegetation, rainfall, uh, flora and fauna, other kinds of metrics. And so mm -hmm. that's how the three Canadian prairies of um, uh, Manitoba, Saskia uh, Saskatchewan, and um, oh, help me out with the other one, Jeff. Um, that's Manitoba. Was. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and when, um, Alberta, Alberta. Uh, those prairie provinces um, were part of the Great Plains geography okay. just by virtue of um, the kinds of landscape. Um, and then the Plains states, you know, one of the features primarily is the great grasslands. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, that has a particular type of um, geology and uh, geography and only certain mm -hmm. kinds of animals and plants and peoples, they have to adapt to that environment because it's mm -hmm. so different. So that's how we uh, identified right. it is by using the, <laughs> the Center for Great Plains Studies delineation. I think um, Clark Archer and uh, David J. Weber were the two geographers and cartographers that that worked on that okay. and there there were still a few kind of fuzzy areas because you have a a fort that's built in the foothills of the rockies you know is that technically maybe right. not on the great plains but still influential on the great plains mm -hmm. so we would we would be sometimes uh lenient in those gray areas if so you can roughly already. think it's bounded by the the Rockies on the on the western side and the Mississippi uh, drainage on the eastern side. That's approximately mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Right. No, I'm kind of like a, I I lived in southwest southeastern New Mexico and I was in the Llanos Estacados, so I was like, yeah, that, that's sort of the plains in, in a different form than what you would have in North Dakota, yeah, but it's a still... very dry plains. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> uh, ooh, it was dry. That's for sure. <laughs> they don't get as, as much nice tumbleweed up there. So that's, we got, 
<laughs> well, fortunately, with uh, Jeff's writing style, our book's not dry at all. It's uh, it's pretty pretty <laughs> there interesting. We go. Well, I guess I could ask, like, are you going to do like the Force of the Southwest or the Mountain West next? We'll have to see what his time will allow for future collaborations, but it's not out of the question. Oh, good, good. Um, you kind of already answered some of the other thoughts that I had with regard to kind of the the villages, but I guess when we really think about it, then I, I many of us have read like Lewis and Clark's diary, so it would be like, of course, we should have seen this one with the Native American fortresses or. Um, as a student, I had to read uh, Jedediah Smith's or a book on Jedediah Smith's. We don't really have his diaries. He never left us yeah. one, but that Arikara battles that he is engaged in, which also is fortified. So it's. I'm writing an article about that right now. <laughs> oh, well, well, interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting you say that, though, because um, the fortifications pop up in places and photographs and paintings and accounts that I had read before, but now when I was looking for the fortifications, I could actually see the palisades around the village that um, right. George Catlin painted, um, whereas before I wasn't really interested or looking for for the fortification. Right. I, w I was just going to ask, is it, isn't this somewhat like it was always there, it was staring us in the face, and we just never picked up on it definitely yeah <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes those weird situations um but since we are on lewis and clark and jedediah smith this <clears throat> kind of is the second stage then of fortifications in the plains and let me phrase the question this way like how like native american fortifications early explorers, fur traders, like trade posts along the like routes into the West. What changes? What is the same? How how do I like like we all have pictures from Hollywood in our mind. Like how what does it really look like? I would say these early fortifications by explorers like Lewis and Clark and Zebulon Pike or fur traders and trappers that were constructing posts along the Missouri or its tributaries um, were probably smaller than we kind okay. of think about in terms of the, the military establishment and the, and the, and the bigger buildings. Um, some of them could be quite, become quite grand, like uh, Fort Union or Fort Laramie or Bent's Fort. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, the ones that weren't the main feature pieces like those were smaller, smaller entities. Um, they could be constructed out of sod or uh, wooden palisades or other kinds of things. And sometimes they, they would last for a decade or two and other times only a short while. And so um, they had to first find out where the best locations would be to construct them. And then also, which indigenous people's homelands were those located in. So right. if you're going to trade with the crows, it would be a good idea, as Jim Beckworth thought, to ask him where do you want where do you want this post to be? Right. And uh, he would they would actually tell him, we'd rather have it up on this river than down on that one because it's easier to get to or mm. not as close to our enemies or you know whatever. And so that was really interesting too to find out how um, indigenous people played such a key role in this um, fur trade era in locating the forts, helping protect them, etc. Most of those fur trade posts, there weren't a lot of uh, native attacks on them um, because they were providing benefit from mm -hmm. both the indigenous point of view, but also advancing uh, the fur traders' uh, economics as well. So, um, I don't know. Do you want to add anything, Jeff? Yeah. The one group that usually wasn't happy with the forts being built were the enemies of the nation where where the fort was established. And so <laughs> right. if they had to have defenses, it was defenses 
for those potential raids that might come from mm. outsiders that were that would travel a distance to the fort. So it, it, there's a mistake in thinking indigenous people and lumping them all together and mm. thinking, you know, these indigenous nations are nations. They're separate and and independent and rivals. And you saw those rivalries play out as these forts were being built. They, no nation wanted a fort to be established in its enemy's boundaries and territory because it meant they were going to gain access to guns, ammunition, and other trade goods that would give them a, an advantage against against them. So, so diplomacy playing out in 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 some form here is that it's like I want what you have and I will prevent what you have from actually materializing. And yeah. not only do you have the rivalries between the indigenous nations, but by the 1830s, you have competition between fur companies. Right. And so they're building rival posts right next to each other sometimes. And we can see this in our modern day <laughs> cities where bookstores or grocery chains or other mm -hmm. kinds of things will kind of see who can out compete uh in a neighborhood yeah. and so that's kind yeah. of what was going on there too yeah it sort of like reminds me of Hobbs where i lived it was like here's home depot five minute walk not even drive five minute walk away like a minute drive there's Lowe's. like they're, they're like right next to each other like wow <laughs> like, yeah. yeah exactly like you 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 want you know this is the perfect spot for it and you're gonna you're gonna go for it. And I kind of I guess in in entailing what you're saying is that were these more for like show when it comes to defense or like I, I can't really like I don't know how many people we're talking about when we talk about like a fur trade outpost. It's like 10 guys, 20 guys, 30 guys, like do they even have a chance to defend that larger palisade wall against a committed attack? Like, That's a good point, um, because often these are more of warehouses and storage facilities right. because the, the trappers and traders would be going off to um, get involved in certain kinds of activities, right? So mm -hmm. unless it's to defend against grizzly bears or blackfeet <laughs> or something like that. Um, Right. there's there's not like a military unit that's stationed at the fort to protect it. It's just the people that are there. So you've got a, a tra chief trader, bourgeois, um, who's kind of the one who's responsible. Um, mm -hmm. He would accept the, the items in trade for the furs and hides that he exchanged them for. Um, and then it could be a place of refuge if there was mm -hmm. a danger where the yeah. trappers or traders could come back and then together they could help fortify that position. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're right. that That's why these smaller establishments were, you know, built in that way so that they could just be a safe place to store materials. Okay. And, and Jay can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, I think probably the strongest defense for some of the forts were the local, indigenous people who would a lot of times mm. build their their encampments around the fort so they could be close and they they served as somewhat of a defense as far as the numbers went probably more so <laughs> than americans were All right no that that makes total sense now i'm going to throw you guys a curveball question because you, you already said that these forts don't last long and just like it's wooden material it's like it rots away i mean it totally makes sense like if you don't maintain it, it goes away um but where in the west would we like if somebody today wanted to be like i want to see what like a fur trade outpost looked like where would i go is there a place where i could still see like like something reminiscent of that there are um Many of those have been reconstructed. Okay. So they're they're not like they were in 1825, um, but we wouldn't expect them to be no. uh, two centuries later. And so you can go to you know Fort Bridger, Fort Laramie, Bent's Fort, mm. 
uh, Fort Union, um, Fort Gary, Lower Fort Gary. Um, some of these have been maintained and have become national historic sites or Ooh. state parks or um, private entities. And Ooh. so there's some upkeep and visitation that continues there. And so all of those places would are wonderful to visit. Um, Bent's Fort's really fun to go to because it's it's built in a different fashion than the others. It's it's mostly adobe in this mm -hmm. in the southwest down in Colorado. Um, whereas when you go to Fort Laramie, it's more of the military complex where they have the stables for the horses and the commissaries and all the buildings mm -hmm. for the hospital and the everything. Um, and then Fort Union, the classic one in uh, Montana and North Dakota, they're on the border. Um, that was kind of the center of the fur trade from the mm -hmm. um, 1830s to the 1860s. And so it's kind of been kept in, in that historic era. It didn't change over time, like, say, Fort Laramie. And so um, okay. those are, you can see a whole variety of different things, but um you're right that there aren't very many that would remain. Um, and those that did were usually at key geographic, um, mm -hmm. strategic uh, locations um, or had additional purposes later, like they served the Overland Trail or mm -hmm. they're located on a, a key river or road or railroad mm -hmm. or something like that. So that ensured that some lasted and, and some didn't. The, the key to lasting was repurposing as the mm -hmm. times changed. So during the fur trade era, the forts that were great as part of the fur trade, when that era was winding down, those that that became emporiums for pioneer travel mm -hmm. across the plains, they stayed and the others faded away into the, you know, into the prairie. And then after the pioneer era, those that were able to become military establishments and had an important location. They, but repurposing was really the key to, to the forts continuing to exist. In our, in our, uh, at the end of the book, there's a guide that goes through mm -hmm. by each Canadian province and then each state, the forts that are there. And in that guide, it talks about which ones are still, you can still go and, and there's something there. Some of them, there's just a historical marker, but some of them have been reconstructed. And some of them we don't know. I mean, we just don't know where they were exactly because the prairies reclaimed them so well. Yeah. We was... also didn't did didn't list a lot of the indigenous ones just out of respect for the people who remain. Um mm -hmm. and we don't want trespassers or vandals to okay. interfere in any fashion with that. So unless they were already known sites, we we didn't include those locations oh that, that, that's very very nice um and uh <laughs> considering western tourism definitely a good decision because you know people people like to go off-roading a lot in the west <laughs> <laughs> um no so <clears throat> yeah i want to go back to you like your your appendix there was all the forts later a little bit um and I will also say that for a few moments that you threw me off because there's a because I have a very different Fort Union in mind when you say Fort Union. <laughs> <laughs> I have the one in New Mexico in my mind, which is vastly different, of course. We wrote about both of them. You did. Yes, you did. <laughs> and um well, I suppose that is a good lead over to to that other Fort Union because um it is located on the Santa Fe Trail. And with that comes a new opportunity now, right? That like we're not quite I don't want to quite yet go to the military age when the US military enters, but when these forts move away from being emporiums for the fur traders, but become spaces where people can stop and rest along the way. So how does that does that change in any shape or form the character of these forts that you now have every few weeks uh, for a few months, tons of people coming through, going to Oregon, California, 
the Mormons going to Utah and stuff. Oh, yeah, it definitely changed the the nature of the forts at certain times of the year, depending on where they were on the trail. Mm -hmm. You know, those that were further to the east, they'd get hurt, hurt, hit early in the spring with just crowds of people, depending on the to the era, you know, what era of the pioneer travel we're talking about. Right. But yeah, they would just be over, you know, there would be an overflow of traffic at certain times of the year. And then they be pretty quiet after that oh. rush of traffic would pass through. But those pioneer journals give us a pretty good feel for kind of the, the chaos a little mm -hmm. bit at some of these forts. In fact, uh, one of the journals, the pioneers wrote about how the soldiers that were stationed at the fort were trying to buy goods from them, mm. at, from the pioneers <laughs> traveling through because there were shortages of, of uh, whiskey and other things at the fort. Oh. In these rush times, but yeah, um, it definitely changed. And again, Jay can probably add more about that. Well, I mean, that's yeah, Jeff, like I'm just going to do a follow up. up on that. How do you like you are? You're supposed to supply people, but you need to get supplies too, right? So you have to rely on wagons delivering supplies to you. That then people traveling by wagon continue taking with them. And, and the government was very supportive of the of pioneer travel. And so in some yeah. cases, the forts were required to sell the goods at basically at cost or with very little profit when they oh, were being managed yeah. and run by government organizations. But oh my God. Yeah, when you think about somewhere between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand immigrants yeah. are traveling across the Great Plains to Utah, Oregon, California, New Mexico. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of need um, yeah. Yeah. at each of those locations. And so one of the things that um, some of the entrepreneurs figured out pretty quickly is they would make more money supplying the fortifications than they would being the owners of the fort. Um, <laughs> one of the people who, who did this was Robert Campbell. He had learned during the fur trade that even though he built several forts, um, he'd made a lot more money when he was supplying the rendezvous uh, yeah. people that were traveling to the, the summer fair. And so he became one of the principal suppliers out of St. Louis for places like um, Fort Laramie and some mm -hmm. of the other forts on the Missouri. And so they would have to try to get as many supplies out there for the spring rush yeah. before the onslaught of the migrants who would leave um, from the eastern part of the plains in mm -hmm. April or May to start their two to three to four month journey across the plains. And so wow. um, you're right that that was a logistics that they had to to figure out. And, and one of the reasons that why after 1869 with the coming of the railroads, there wasn't quite as much need for these fortifications in some locations just because the railroad or steam travel or other kinds of transportation could supply that want. Yeah, that's a great lead over too, because now, so by the 1850s, 60s, we're, we're seeing the railroad construction moving westward, where like, we're still seeing a massive flow of people to California, Oregon, uh, Utah, Colorado was a gold rush in 1860. So there's still like tons of people traveling through the plains. But now you also have some military entering the picture. And like in the case of Fort Laramie, they're taking over Fort Laramie. So do some of those proprietors, businessmen stay at these forts and just kind of, well, there's the military next door, but I'm still going to do what I have done for the last 10 years. Or are they kind of resyncing their role in, in the new environment? Do you want to take this one, Jeff? <laughs> well, I was waiting for you, but yeah, I think <laughs> I, so. I think uh, Fort Laramie is probably a good example of that transition. And Jay, you know a lot more about Fort Laramie than I do. So maybe you, you could use that as an example to talk about okay. that. Yeah. So when the army, um, they get involved in the overland trail travel, 
Um, mm -hmm. And there are congressional acts that get the U.S. military involved in protecting the the immigrant trains and also Indians from depredation from from migrants. And so yeah. that's used as the justification for either commandeering, renting, or buying these posts and taking them over. Uh, for example, um, in the case of Fort Laramie, they they buy the fur trade post and then it triples in size as more men and personnel and other things come out there. The same is true at Fort Leavenworth, um, which is is one in Kansas that uh -huh. is now one of the, the largest forts in right. the United States. Um, and it's it's been around since 1827. And so these these posts, like Jeff mentioned, that could re be repurposed for other needs um, were really important. And one other item that you might find interesting for your Civil War listeners is that um, following during and following the Civil War, um, there was a, a lot more expansive mindset of using the military for oh, conquest oh. of right. indigenous nations. And so yes. um, some of the stories we tell are forts that were built during the Civil War era out mm -hmm. on the plains. Uh, for like the Bozeman Trail Wars, for instance. And so those have such an interesting um, history about how um, they're trying to protect the trails, but they were totally unable to do so because the Lakotas were just in control for that whole war, basically, until new armaments um, came out in uh, 1867. But um, some Civil War... Um, aficionados may not know that um, Sherman and Sheridan and Custer had all cut their teeth during the Civil War and then they're transferred out onto the Great Plains um, after the Civil War to be involved in these military campaigns on the northern, central, and southern plains. And so we tried to provide some context for that. And also the last Confederate general to surrender was um, an indigenous man named Stan Wati, um, a member of the Cherokee Nation, who had ran a unit of the Cherokee Braves that had fought on behalf of the Confederacy. And he doesn't surrender until several months after Appomattox. And so it's kind of an interesting side note. No, totally, right? And it's when you... It, the the reality, like you're you're saying, right? There's a lot of Civil War historians who are like Virginia and everything beyond Virginia doesn't matter. <laughs> but I, I always told my students in my classes that I was like, it's not like we like like old video recording systems, right? We put the stop button on and everything stops in the West. It, it continues. It's it's still ongoing. It's different players, different interactions. Maybe it's not the U.S. military. It's maybe state militia units but they're all still fighting it's there's people still moving west it's not like this there's an end to it it's or nothing happens right You're um muted, Jeff. part of the right. aftermath of this conquest was the removal of many indigenous nations to uh, reservations yeah. and um the military and the u.s government constructed fortifications adjacent to each mm -hmm. of those indigenous reservations some some reason was for helping supply um, the agencies and the reservations but part of it too was for um, patrolling and to make sure that mm -hmm. people weren't leaving that shouldn't and stuff like that so there's a lot of interaction uh, that continues into the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, and so we've, we've tried to include some examples of that as well. Sorry, Jeff, you were... You know what? That's just almost exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> so great mind. Like. Yes, like we said before we started. Uh, but I, I, I kind of liked your point and... Uh, I, I kind of want to throw this out to you and see what your what your thoughts are that a video I showed my students to kind of give them a very brief kind of statement of like what what to imagine a Western fort looked like. 
And the authors of this were like, when it came down to the to Western Plains Fords in the kind of third quarter, let's say, of the 19th century, they weren't the forts of like European armies fighting each other, like fortifications. They were outposts for a constabulatory force, a, a police force, and that the U.S. military sort of was a a police force that kept an eye on activities in the West and sometimes had to take a, a bigger role in, in regard to fighting. Would, would you agree with that as sort of a characterization? I yes. would. Um, I think I think a lot of the 19th century forts are actually modeled on the indigenous fortifications that the that the Mandan and Hadassas and Arikras had already employed in their villages. The 18 foot logs that are buried three or four feet deep, leaving about a 15 foot palisade. Mm -hmm. The walls um, of the homes inside adjacent to the walls about five feet down below the top of the wall so that you could walk along the edge of the thing and find some protection mm -hmm. um, from, from an invading force. I see that same construction in many of the fur trade and military forts. Um, some additions that were included were um, bastions on each end, um, mm -hmm. kind of in a opposite end of the rectangle so that um, you could find firing lines down all four walls of the fort. And that's why many of the forts were in some kind of a square or rectangular fashion. Mm -hmm. But there are other forts that that were circular or used other kinds of architectural designs as well. So I think just um, these aren't like forts that you would see in a castle in <laughs> in uh, Europe or Austria yeah. Um, yeah. because there's not a lot of cannon fire that's going to be besieging the fort and things like that. And so it's just a different style of warfare and there was no need to go to that great expense to build these these mm -hmm. huge things if if that wasn't the case. I think the closest thing you see to the European fortifications are the Spanish presidios that are built mm -hmm. in the 17th and 18th century before they really realized what the fighting was going to be like, you know, in on the plains. And so, you know, that's the closest thing. But a lot of these other what we call forts, some of them were had a, a wall that was completely missing. Like they'd just be three-sided open right. towards the stream. Or, so they weren't, uh, what we call forts were really more what you'd think of as a trading post or just mm -hmm. an outpost in some cases. Well, yeah. And some, like I, I'm thinking of Fort Union or Fort Davis places that I have seen, they had no, no, no walls at all in those cases. Um, especially yeah, yeah. like the post Civil War one, and let me again throw this out: Do you think that the U.S. military kind of was like, well, why should we put palisades around it? An enemy would not be stupid enough to attack a fort with three, four hundred soldiers inside of it. Is that sort of the thinking behind it, or is it is it that arrogance or realism that just no, they they would not do this? Well, there, I'm trying to think of some examples. Um, I can't think of too many times when um, indigenous peoples attacked fortifications um, right. because they recognized that it was foolhardy and that they would be at a disadvantage. Um, mm -hmm. The same is true for um, in 1823, this Arikara War that I'm writing about. Um, mm -hmm. Colonel Leavenworth is um, sent right. upriver to okay. go punish the Arikaras, and he fires on their village for three days. And after that time, he's like, "We're not really making much headway, <laughs> right?" So, so the fortifications <clears throat> work for those kinds of things. And so, I think by trial and error, both Indigenous people and uh, Americans both figured out the forts are are mainly to provide housing and shelter and storage for goods. And then, um, you know, there, and some defense, but not necessarily its primary um, 
thing. Yeah, Fort Kearney is another just great example of what mm. pioneers would arrive at Fort Kearney and they would say, what is this? This is not a fort. <laughs> I mean, even then it didn't look like what they expected a fort to be. There are a few sod huts and, and but there's no palisade around it. And, mm. and uh, it was disappointing for a lot in the journals. You can read about their disappointment when they got there. Uh, and Nils, you have to also remember this is the Great Plains. There's yeah. there's not many trees. I know, so right? It, you know how many trees it takes to build a fort? So a lot. You have to either have a wooded river valley that has this resource, or you need to wait till the railroad where you can ship some yeah. in. So right. it makes yeah. no sense, right? Like, why would I build a massive fort? with massive palisades when there's no trees that I can use. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, but I think you, you are correct, right? Like it's sort of this, people have sort of that image in their minds then and now of like what a Ford military outpost looks like. And it's sort of like, oh, that's not what I expected to see. Like that's, I, I think that you have that a lot, even still today with tourists that they come to these forts and they're like, oh, no, I did not think that would be what I would see. Yeah. Most yeah. of the forts that have been reconstructed um, do have walls. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of uh, Lower Fort Gary up in Manitoba or um, Fort, Fort Laramie had a, a wall at one time. Um, Bent's Fort. Is mm -hmm. kind of an enclosed place. Uh, Fort Snelling, definitely fortified. So, um, right. you, the ones that remain do look fortish, if you will. There, there's the elements of defensive fortifications of ditches or walls or right. bastions or palisades or whatever. And that might contribute. That might contribute to the kind of this wrong view of what the majority of the forts looked like because these exceptions are still you can still visit, see well yeah they're, they're inviting right like that's what i expect to see so that's what i'm oh happy to see <laughs> like self-fulfilling prophecy on some level there um <clears throat> but i i do want to at the end talk a bit about hollywood and the image of the ford but let's turn briefly to canada because i was um, you, you made a good case earlier on, like why Canada matters and in the book you do too, but um, how, how, how did you feel writing about Canada? You, I think you're both more U.S. historians, so Canada was something a little bit less normal for you guys to kind of look at, right? Oh, it, it, that was one of my favorite chapters to write. I think okay. because it was a little bit unfamiliar to me. So I took the first pop at it and Jake cleaned it up after. But uh, I was really interested in um, just the role, just the connection between the United States and Canada during mm -hmm. the time period. This is post the, when the fur trade is starting to wind down a little bit. And there, the trade shifts to Buffalo robes, uh, Fort Benton, which was on the Missouri River in Montana, became, uh, they call it the world's most innermost, uh, inland most port. So uh, boat travel could travel all the way up the Mississippi and then the Missouri all the way into Montana. And then goods could be shipped by wagons across the border into Canada and by goods uh, alcohol was one of the primary goods that was being shipped across. And there were a handful of American merchants, United States uh, merchants who just made a fortune shipping from Fort Benton across the border illegally into Canada, the, uh, the alcohol, and then they would, load up the buffalo robes and bring them back make a fortune mm -hmm. on that trade and so it didn't take long before a lot of americans were engaged in this oh. and as this 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 trade expanded uh after a while there started to be some contention some fighting and the the people that lived in this area of canada a lot of them were had descended from French. A lot of them were indigenous, had indigenous roots. They were not huge fans of 
<laughs> this British Canadian, the Canadian government, the new Canadian government. Yeah. And so Canada started to have some worries about what might happen out here with all these strong ties between the United States and Canada. And so they sent the Northwest Mounted Police out into the area to try to put an end to the the illegal trade that was going on. And the there were no trails across the plains of uh, the prairies of Canada because the whoop up trail. What's that? The whoop up trail. Yeah. So the whoop up trail and most of the trails were running north and south from the American <laughs> side to the Canadian side. So there weren't any trails going east and west. The rivers were mm. used primarily for transportation right. east and west. So when the Northwest Mounted Police headed out, they they had a terrible time finding these right. forts uh, were at risk of perishing through a winter where they really didn't know where they were. Finally, once they got established, their goal was to end trade with the Americans, but they brought families and they brought uh, settlers and that <sighs> actually expanded the trade. Right. They just put an end to the illegal trade and and Fort Benton continued to be an important uh, uh, what emporium for goods that were being shipped into the the prairie regions of Canada. It's really a, an interesting story of and, a, and yeah. strong connections between the United States and Canada through that. And I just got back from visiting some of those Canadian forts um, oh. a few months ago. And, you know, it's hard being in Utah or in Austria and thinking about a place that is as flat as Manitoba, but <laughs> Man, oh, easy. you can see a long ways <laughs> and so um like he says the the river travel or um was preferred if possible and then if not oh. red river carts or some other mode of transportation could be used but going overland was sure a lot more work and took a lot more time sometimes uh, and so um one of the other things is that canadians would um they had a little different fort building style they would instead of having the palisades go up and down, they would go horizontal. So they would put them on some kind of a base so that it wouldn't rot and then and then build the walls up, whitewash them. Or they even had some kind of mortise and tendon connections where they could interlace the logs so they would be uh, sturdier. So some oh. interesting dynamics that were a little different from some of their American counterparts. Yeah, I was I, I was actually going to ask about that because I was kind of curious if like I like let me start by this like how like okay I I understand the U.S. military in the West right like we have our cavalry units we have the always overlooked infantry units say company here companies there like maybe five companies in a bigger Ford and we send like. 700 800 a thousand men out to corner like sitting bull or go after the nest purse what do i have to imagine numbers wise equipment wise was like the northwest mounted police like i i kind of have that 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 cheesy movie was that one guy going <laughs> west out trying to deal with all these native problems in my mind right now Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that as far as the numbers that were stationed at the different outposts. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Do you have an idea about that, Jay? I, my my sense is that they they weren't stationed by large numbers of of it's troops. Just, yeah. uh, that's my kind of my gut feeling, but I don't know that I've ever really researched the numbers exactly. And before that time, most of the law and order was actually conducted by the Hudson's Bay Company. Yes. And so they had a series of laws and expectations that uh, natives and newcomers would operate under. And so um, they would administer justice according to how those laws were being followed. So um, I don't think there was a, a huge military presence on the plains because, first of all, there weren't too many Canadians that were going there to live unless they were involved in trade. Right. And so many of the traders either intermarried or 
became living like uh, indigenous and and Métis peoples were living. Right. And so um, I would say that it was more controlled by the company for a while and then some rocking or uh, some mounted police later on in the mm -hmm. 60s yeah. and 70s. Well, yeah, and when you, as you mentioned, the Métis, because Duncan Campbell and I have that in our new book, the Civil War in the Age of Nationalism, it's like it's guys from from the East, militia units, troops from the East coming to, um, gosh, what would this be like, um, like Alberta and Saskatchewan for the Red River Rebellion to put that down. So it's not not even local, local forces necessarily that would be engaged in this. So it's a... Uh, yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting contrast, I guess, to kind of mm -hmm. see these differences between how how Canadians versus the United States do this Western Plains um, policing process. <laughs> um, now let's talk about <laughs> we kind of like I tell my I, I usually talk about idioms when I talk tell uh, teach english and of course why the elephant in the room is always the one that i like to bring up to kind of be like you know what, what does this mean to my students but for us today the elephant in the room is sort of hollywood that the image hollywood has given us with regard to the western fort so which let me start with worst which Hollywood movie does the worst when it comes to <laughs> presenting a Western fort. Let's start with that one. Hmm. Well, that I've just been thinking of some of the recent movies that have been made. Have Have yeah. you seen The Revenant? I have. Uh, that depicts a fort, um, but it also is a little bit different than the fort probably would have looked like mm -hmm. do you know what i mean and so right. it conveys us a, a certain idea um how can this do some other ones jeff you know as far as a particular movie i you know i can't name a particular movie but just that scene of all of the indians attacking openly a, right. a stone fort is just really, really wrong. I mean, they, it, it's as likely that there were indigenous people in the fort helping defend it if there if there were was an assault right. on the fort. And the forts are definitely don't look like the ones that are 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 shown in most of these Hollywood films. And so, I think to me that's the biggest misconception is the idea that the indigenous people are all one unified force. Mm -hmm. That is uh, against those that are in the forts. When in actuality, just really uh, a different scenario than that. Much more complicated with allies and enemies in really complicated kinds of ways. Yeah, there's a lot more peace and friendship and comity mm -hmm. than than we would commonly think of. Well, well that doesn't make for good movies, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I kind of adding to that when you say like the attack of natives onto a fort, I, I, I kind of showed, I think it was like Seventh Cavalry with Randall Scott, just the opening two minutes to my students. And I was like, look, this is how large the Seventh Cavalry is. Do you think that many men plus horses fit in that fort that Hollywood just gave <laughs> us? And most of my students were like, yeah, you're right. They don't fit. Right. That that's um so when you like like we can go to the you already had the um revenant, but I also found like hostiles. Have you seen hostiles as a film? Mm -hmm. I found that one was really well done and sort of I think it was in Kansas when they were in one of the forts, and how it was just that that great large number of buildings that they were engaged one of with. the interesting surprises are places that were constructed during the the indian campaigns uh or indians of the 1870s but a place like um in nebraska fort robinson um, mm. eventually it becomes a place where the u.s 
military will breed horses and mules for military service. Oh, that uh, if you've seen the move, what's a uh, war horse about mm -hmm. horses in World War One and uh, World War Two? There's there's a lot of things you don't think about that the army would have a particular right. fort that was raising horses and mules to participate in in the war right. effort. So that's right. kind of kind of different. No, totally. Yeah, well, that's that's a good point. Didn't even think of that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what other any other movies that you can think of that recently came out that were like good and in, in representing the Western Fort? Like, I mean, we can have a long list of the bad ones. <laughs> of course, <laughs> <laughs> that's very easy. So many of the films are depictions of the the Indian Wars. Um, right. It does give this distorted image of they were just fighting all the time and a lot of them were taking place around the forts, but that wasn't really the case. Um, and so it's kind of a misconception to start with because um, right. you're, you're doing most of the filming around the fort and the interactions there. And so most of the events are happening outside the fort. Right. It's out there in the plains where the skirmishing takes place rather than pitch battles that make for good movie, but. Or, okay. or the, or the fighting takes place in the, in the indigenous villages where mm -hmm. soldiers that are stationed at the fort wait until winter, know right. where the, the indigenous people are have settled for the winter and then go out and do these winter campaigns, especially during the civil right. war years. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that was, have you seen brutal. dances with wolves? Yes, <laughs> of course. That was a different kind of a fortification that, that, uh, yes, that Dunbar tiny little one. To. Yeah, how I, I was going to ask. That didn't how, look very impressive, did it? At all. Were there a lot of instances where you have sort of like, I know in the Civil War we had sort of like blockhouses where like along the railroads, some uh, river crossings of railroads, they just created like a, a house type fortifications. Do we have any of that in the West where it's just like, I don't know, like, like 10 men, 20 men are stationed. I'm not aware of any. That was, that was I'm not there either. There might so. be, but that's not something I know. Okay. Well, I was just curious because it was sort of, you know, like blockhouse, right? Like dances was wolf, like the one man mission. <laughs> they used to have those along the railroads. Uh, you can mm -hmm. see those as you drive along the interstate highways and things like that. Yeah. But those, that's a different era, right? Really, right. so I don't think they're they're really manned now. Yeah, <laughs> no. Uh, so final, just towards growing towards the end here slowly. What's your favorite what planes fort? Like still there, you can go to, you can see. Which one would you like? If if like I'm tour uh, tourist wanting to see a real planes fort or outpost or military post like i give you three like which three would you say are the best we start well, with I, jeff. we have some jeff i i well hmm i haven't been to fort benton but if i were if i was to choose one to go to now i'd like to go check that out have you been there jay yes um I've been to Fort Benton, Fort Union, uh, Fort Laramie, Bent's Fort. I would, I think all of those are awesome. Mm. Um, I grew up outside of a fort. It's not on the plains, but Fort Bridger. Mm -hmm. um, it started out as a fur trade fort in the 1840s. Then it became an overland trail emporium, and then it became a military base. So it fits all the models we've been talking about. It's just located a hundred miles off the plains. Um, but so I, I grew up going to that place a lot every year and Field trip that's day. still a place that I visit. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so I, I think any of those that have been maintained and, um, are, are worthwhile to support. Mm -hmm. 
you were going to add some of that or just i hear a lot well, of northern I, I just visited those uh, <laughs> fort lower gary up in manitoba and i thought that was that was an incredible fort i would yeah. recommend people go to go to winnipeg and take a little road trip up to see yeah. that now i hear a lot of northern plains what about like like Fort Laramie or Fort Union in New Mexico or Fort Davis, um, Fort Stanton. Um, Bent's Fort would be fun. Yeah, Bent's Fort. Yeah, Bent's Fort is great. Um, even the the ruins of Fort Union are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the Alamo, people still go there. Oh, uh, yeah, you did have that in there. Um, yeah, so there's I kind there's of skipped that section because I didn't. Like, yeah, yeah, we I didn't get to the southern plains as often as I do the northern and central yeah. plains. Yeah, yeah, a lot of Texas, a lot of Texas forts all through the eras from Spanish colonization up until really today, but we haven't really touched on them all. But yeah, uh, well, you can leave the Alamo out, I, I don't mind that. <laughs> And there are several of these indigenous places that are mm -hmm. national historic sites and mm -hmm. people should go and look at those as well. Right. Cause it, it kind of takes them back to imagine what life would have been like right. and the dif difficulties and opportunities of, of using those kinds of establishments and fortifications. Right. Now, and it makes this a final one. <laughs> Do you think that in part, we still have sort of that Hollywoodized popular image of the Western fort because like, I mean, let's face it, like when you talk about some of these forts in Montana or West Texas or New Mexico or West Kansas or Western Nebraska, we're not talking tourist trails. Here. We're not talking like easily accessible for like your tourists from the, from Europe. You're going to California. You're going to Florida. You're you're going to the Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, maybe Phoenix. You're not going to Montana. You're not going to West Kansas. Is that maybe a contributing factor? Why the image still is sort of that somewhat unrealistic for it? Yeah, that that's hard to answer because I think if. If they were to go to the forts that have been reconstructed, it might reinforce the misconception sure. rather than, than uh, mm -hmm. take it on. And so, yeah, that's a great question. It, it's uh, I don't know. Most of the forts that have been reconstructed um, were some of the more important ones of their era. And so I think that they're they're worthwhile to, to visit just as interesting as um, – some of the other places people travel to um, oh, yeah. in the United States. So yeah. um, put it on your bucket list. Come back over and, and check some of these out. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed. I saw Fort Union and Fort Davis, um, uh, Fort Craig, um, not quite a Plains Fort. But I found it was wonderful experiences to kind of see this, just just the expanse, right? You You can't visualize with a map or images how big these forts actually were with all of these ex these buildings the quarters for the soldiers officers commissary hospital like like this whole machinery that goes with it well they were many communities um, yeah. all of the the families that were participating um as well as the the men and others that were um, employed there. But some of the forts like Fort Gary up in um, Manitoba, um, it's in downtown Winnipeg. The right. city's built around it. It's yeah. the exact center of town. And so um, that's why they reconstructed lower Fort Gary because it's outside Easy. of town and they didn't have to fight with the hotels and the, you know, all the infrastructure. Right. Of the, of right. the city. Yeah, um, totally. That's an interesting point, though, that some of the some of these forts became towns and cities and communities, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so they were kind of subsumed by the urban sprawl. But right. those that were in remote areas that are not always on the tourist path, um, 
those are the ones that that end up getting reconstructed um so that that's fascinating <laughs> crazy right <laughs> um all right well i greatly appreciate you guys taking the time today to talk about your new book and the fascinating topics that plains forts are from ancient native american times to the modern day and in the u.s and canada if you're interested in the book it's great plains forts by jay buckley and jeffrey noakes published by bison press and you can get it obviously by at the university Mm -hmm. Bison Press, yeah, Bison University Books of Nebraska Press, Press and or University Bison of Nebraska Books. Press. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, or Amazon, or or yeah. Amazon, or independent booksellers, or potentially a signed copy by email from <laughs> either Jeff or Jay, if you're interested. There but you again, go. thank you so much for taking the time and um, chatting about your wonderful project. Thanks, yeah, Niels. Very welcome. Yeah, thank you.